Good morning. You guys ready to worship today? Hey, I can almost guarantee you we're the only church in America that had two Palm Sundays. So if you guys can have one Palm Sunday and a Dosso Palm Sunday. That's how you say it in Spanish, I think. If you guys want to go ahead and stand up with us, we're going to worship. Palm Sunday 2.0, that's what we've been calling it. Or Amanda calls it Face Palm Sunday because there's that. But no, I was just I was listening to this song this morning before we before I got here. I was just it just reminded me, you know, when they were singing Hosanna, Hosanna, they're singing Save Us, Save Us. And it just reminded me of how God has saved me. It just reminded me that God took me out of my junk, took me out of my old life, my old life of sin and without hope and just how he took me out of that and placed me in a new life and my purpose, and he saved me. And I know we have a lot of people in this place that have a similar story like that. But I'm just thankful this morning that when I called, that he answered. When I called out the name of Jesus, that he saved me. Amen? Amen. So this morning, we're going to sing about it. We're going to praise because now he saved us, right? And we have something to worship about. We have something to praise him about because we've experienced and we've encountered the King of Glory this morning. Amen? So this morning, Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for, for saving us this morning. God, we thank you for taking us out of that pit of despair. And God, giving us hope and a purpose in life in you, Jesus. God, we just thank you this morning for your life, for just giving your life for us, God. And Lord, we worship you this morning. God, we just say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Come save us now. Come, come get us now because, Lord, we want to be with you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's let's sing this song. 2.0. We're going to do it again. Is that okay? Okay. Steve says it's sure. So.
you thankful for that this morning. Cause in your presence, all our fears, they're washed away. Come on, sing again, let me see. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Cause in your presence, all our fears, they're washed away. Wash away.
in Hosanna, when we sing, God, come save us, his word says, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this morning, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what things that some trials or circumstances you're facing this morning. But I can tell you something from experience. When I've called on the name of the Lord, he's answered. When I've called the name Jesus, he's come running. And I'm telling you, when I needed saving, he came to my rescue. Amen. So we're going to sing this song. But if you need a touch from the Lord this morning, you call out that name of the Lord. You call out that name Jesus. And I promise you, he'll come running. Amen.
I didn't answer. You called on my name all throughout your life, but yet you thought I just stayed silent towards you. But don't get it mistaken, because I put you through this discipline process to get you from where you were to get you to where you are now, so that you can fully surrender your life to me. The, the Lord says, I have not, I have not forsaken you, I have not left you. I have been with you from day one. I have watched you as a child, and I've watched you grow until now. I have never left you, nor have I forsaken you, and I'm not going to leave you or forsake you today. The Lord says, if you will call on my name now, now is the time. Now is the time. If you will call on my name, says the Lord, I will answer, and I will change. I will give you a clean heart. I will take that old heart of stone, and I will give you that heart of flesh. The things you thought were never possible, I will make possible in your life. But now is the time to call on my name. If you'll just call out my name, if you just call out my name, I'll answer. I'll be there for you. I'll walk you through the process. I'll, I'll take you hand by hand, and I'll walk with you on this journey. I'm telling you guys, the Lord loves us so much. And sometimes when we think of when God is not answering our prayers or he's remaining silent, that he's being angry or he's hating us, but it's not, that's not the case. The Lord puts us in situations to grow us and to equip us and to form us into what he wants us to be. So don't think that his discipline is just anger out on you, but any good father would discipline his child and the same way the Lord will do to you. So, Father, this morning, God, we call out the name Jesus. Come on, church. Can we just do this for a minute? Just put your hands up. Just raise your hands and just say, Jesus, we just call out the name Jesus. Just call out his name. Just call out his name. Call out his name. It's so simple. Even a child can do it. Jesus, we call on your name this morning. God, we say we need you. We need saving in our life, Lord. God, we need structure in our life. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit in our life, Jesus. Father, we call on your name this morning. Jesus, 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 You know, the enemy would love for you to feel like the Lord has left you and forsaken you. He would love to put you in that bondage where you thought that the Lord just said, he just took his hand off of you. But I want you to know that the Lord is saying this morning that if you just call on the name of Jesus, if you just call on his name this morning, all the lies of the enemy, everything will be taken away. And you get a clean slate this morning with Jesus. You get a clean slate this morning with Jesus. He's going to walk with you. He's going to talk with you. He's going to guide you. And he's going to lead you. But you need his Holy Spirit. You need his Holy Spirit in your life. You need his spirit in you. You need your, his spirit in you, amen? amen? So come on, let's sing this one more time, this chorus. I called and you answered. You came to my rescue. for a few minutes, just keep playing it, but I just want us to seek the Lord this morning. Can we just take a minute and just call on his name, just call out to him. If there's a need in your life, I don't know if it's salvation, or maybe you need uh, you need to be relieved from something, or maybe you have situations in your life that you need you need relief, you need to take it away from you, you need strength to persevere through them. Come on, let's just press in right now in this moment. 
Just say, Jesus, just come in. Just begin to cry out his name. Come on, we need to hear you this morning. Just begin to cry out the name of Jesus. Begin to seek him for that situation that you need, that you need help in. Salvation is one of them. I don't, I don't understand it, but yet my life has been changed by it. I can't explain it, but yet the Lord has touched my life and changed me because he's given me salvation. He's given me that clean heart. He's given me a new life. He's given me his Holy Spirit. I can't explain it, but we have his blood covering us. We have new life in him. Amen. So this morning, I want to sing this song as we just stand amazed how marvelous he is, how we, as we stand amazed on the, on the things that he's given us and done in our life, we stand amazed because we don't understand it, but yet we receive it, and we know it, we, we encounter it, amen? So let's sing this out, I stand amazed. Yeah. 
It's absolutely remarkable. You know, before service this morning, uh, the worship team was gathered around here and we were praying. I'm going to put Connie on the spot because what she prayed so blessed my heart. And I think it ought to be our prayer. Her prayer went something like this. It was, God, Jesus, I want to go back to the cross. I want to go back to that place. I want this week... I want you to come alive. I'm going to ask Connie to lead us in that prayer. But you know, this, this is that week, friends. This is that week when we remember our, our Savior, his, the week of His passion, his, his, his commitment to us, His giving it all out for us. And, you know, I mean, this is it, man. On Wednesday night, I was thinking about, I mean, we just finished our study in 1 Corinthians, and I was kind of debating on what to do this week and I've Lord's laid it on my heart just to go over this week of passion with you, show you from the scripture everything that took place in Christ's life. Friday night we have our uh, a Good Friday service in which we're going to celebrate uh, communion together. Uh, Cody's going to bring a word that I love the title, the power of silence. You know, when Jesus stood before Pilate, he was, he was silent. He didn't defend himself. You know, and I said, man, the next Sunday morning, we're going to kick the day off with, with, with breakfast together at 9 o'clock. We're going to open these doors, and we're going to serve breakfast uh, out, upstairs out here in the hallway and in the parlor. And time for fellowship. And then we're going to come, and we're going to, again, we're going to pick up where we left off Friday night. Except now we, we're going to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And isn't that your heart's desire, though? That all through this week, all through this week, may God make himself real to you. Yes. Real to you. Yes. Connie, will you, will you pray that over us? Pray it over the church. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus. this week especially, God, we can feel what you felt, Lord. We can connect with your spirit, Lord God. We can go back and and um, just ask you, God, to give us that sense of what you went through for us, Lord. Help us to really know what it was like to be there, Jesus. Help us to know the, your heart, Lord God. Lord, that we would just connect with you, Jesus, this week, Lord. My heart, Lord God, is to just really know you, Lord Jesus. Know really what you sacrificed. And every Easter we go through the same thing, but God, I pray that it would touch us to our very core, what you went through, Lord, just for us. I thank you, God, that as we get
gather together, Lord, you meet us each personally. You're, you're a personal God. We are known by you, Lord. We thank you for that, Jesus. We pray that you would touch each person here today, Lord, as you are our personal God. You know us by name. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know, guys. Can we just sing this how marvelous? One more time, Cody. breakfast next week and so let me let me just put a bug in your ear especially those that are coming back tonight at five o'clock for our uh, dream team meeting bring a car table with you we need it okay and uh bring it in during the week uh if you if you forget tonight whatever but but we need we need to get a hold of uh, a couple card tables uh for, for the breakfast next week um like i said um also, you know, I just want to remind you, Good Friday service, 7 o'clock, and then Easter Sunday, man, we're going to kick off with a, with a continental, classic continental breakfast, not, not, not Motel 6 style, but some good stuff, and uh, we're having a good time of fellowship. Uh, I want you to remember to, yeah, we, we've got more of those invites for the, for the folks that you put on your, on your prayer list. We've been praying over those, and... Uh, we got more of those invites. I, I, I caught Steve and Patria and uh, Glenda at McDonald's yesterday. They had swiped a bunch of them. They were passing them out and drive through them in the lobby. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, but that's what we want. We want to fill this house. We want to fill this house next week, and uh, we want to see our Savior come through in people's lives. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Till we eat, let's see offer. Father, we just come before you today, and Father, it's a great honor to be in your house yeah. today. And Father, it's an honor to give to you, oh, uh, Father, Jesus. just a blessing to, to give. And uh, Lord, you've blessed us with so much, and we give with thankful hearts and a, and a joyous heart today, Father. Bless the gift and the giver, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, in, in, uh, Don and I uh, went to Florida. We left out of here. Uh, last Sunday evening, we got back uh, Friday morning, and uh, while you all were still in s asleep, we were flying back. And uh, but I had uh, previously asked Jeff to to minister the word. Uh, you know, it's it's people don't really sometimes don't understand what goes into preparing and preaching a message. You know, it's not just a matter of of uh, 
you know, putting something on a piece of paper and getting up here and reading it, man, you gotta get your heart in the right place, you gotta be in tune with God. And I just knew that being being away this week would not allow me that opportunity to, to really get my heart ready. So I asked Jeff to get his heart ready to share God's word with you today. So so Jeff, come on, brother. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So again, today is Palm Sunday, contrary to what Cody told you last week. Amen. Um, so why is Palm Sunday so special? Why is Palm Sunday so special? Jesus came into Jerusalem knowing, keep this in mind, he knew what was going to happen. Not everybody else did, and some of them were denying it. But Jesus knew what was going to take place. So him coming was a big deal. That was him declaring his lordship. There was a lot of symbolism in his entry that we just read. First of all, the donkey. He came in on that donkey. That's a humble thing to do. He didn't come on some magnificent steed, right? He came in on a donkey. But during that time and prior to that, Kings rode in on donkeys to Jerusalem in times of peace. Only in times of peace. So Jesus was showing that it was peace. It was him bringing that. David and Solomon did it before him. He was proclaiming his lordship and the people were acknowledging it. They knew to some extent what was going on. They knew he was coming in the name of the Lord and they knew that he was proclaiming that. Just like it said in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. That was written 500 years early. We, we look at these Old Testament things and then we look forward and we, we might glaze over it sometimes. But that was written 500 years prior. And the kings before that, when they rode in on these donkeys, they went straight to their palace. And I thought it's really interesting that Jesus kind of did the same in a, certain, in a way. He went to the temple. Yeah. He went straight to the temple because that was the spiritual palace. He knew what he was doing. He was very purposeful in that. 
They estimate there was between two and three million people in the city of Jerusalem at that time. That's bigger than Chicago. Not that many people lived there normally, but because of the festivals, people had come. Two to three million people. And this scripture tells us that the whole city was in a stir over this. So, and it's not really hard to see why, you know. They, they don't know an exact number of how many people showed up at the gate and was on the road when he came. But it's pretty reasonable to think it was a couple hundred thousand or more. Imagine that. A football stadium full of people just waiting for him. Jeez. Shouting. This was not a quiet ordeal is what I'm trying to tell you. Keep in mind, all these teachings he was doing, he was drawing thousands of people to a teaching. Not many people even today draw thousands to a teaching, right? And there were a lot less people back then. And then think of the miracles he had performed up to this point. Tons of miracles. If you heard of somebody locally that was performing all these miracles, wouldn't you want to go see it? Right. I know I would. And then not long before this, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was the big one. It even mentions it in scripture that people, people were drawn to that. That was a big deal. They wanted to see him. He was, he was a celebrity. If, if nothing else to them, if they didn't believe him as Lord or King, he was, he was famous to them. They wanted to see him. Um, and not only did they show up for it, though, we see that they were ecstatic. These people were cheering for him, yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That means save us. Or some things say, save us now. Save us now. They wouldn't yell that if they didn't think he could do it. And it just goes further to show that he was proclaiming his lordship. He was doing this publicly. That's why he came in this way. And they acknowledged it. They even threw down their clothes. As he was walking through, or riding through, I should say, on the donkey, they took off their jackets. They were throwing it right in front. Would you do that for anybody today? Can you think of anybody that if they came, you'd just throw your stuff down in front of them? It was a different custom back then, but just to give you an idea, this was huge. This wasn't a small ordeal. They were yelling, save us. He was really loved by these people in the sense of who they thought he was, who they wanted him to be. He was popular to say the least. The problem was that this love they had for him was the hope that he was going to be the physical king to deliver them from the Romans. They weren't looking for him to be the spiritual king. These people weren't lining the streets for that at this point. They were lining the streets because they wanted deliverance from Rome. They wanted a physical king, not a spiritual king. They weren't looking for somebody to forgive them of their sins yet. They just wanted their own ruler. And we still see a little bit of that today, don't we? How many people even here can say that you came to Christ because you needed something? Maybe you hit rock bottom. Um, maybe you just you really needed something. Life wasn't going the way you thought. A lot of us here can say that we came for one of these reasons, right? And that's okay. That's okay. But what happens if your expectation and the reason you came to him isn't fulfilled? What happens if that's not his plan for you? What happens if your need, quote unquote, isn't met by him because you think it's a need? Or you don't get what you want the way you thought you could? Is he still Lord then? Is he still Savior then? Is he still Hosanna in the highest in your life? Well, it's really easy to see for the people at the triumphal entry we just talked about. The answer was no. Not for them. It was their way or the highway. And we'll come to see that. So we see these people praising him on that Sunday when he came in. Throwing the branches, throwing down their jackets, shouting. They're excited. All this stuff going on, right? Hundreds of thousands of people. Can you picture that? Think of like a Super Bowl celebration or something. When Tom Brady marches through whatever city he's winning a Super Bowl for for the 15th time. How crazy they go. This was even more than that. So what changed five days later when this same crowd 
Listen to that part. This same crowd wanted him murdered in the most horrific way they could think of in five days. Only five days passed. What could cause this huge group of people to change up like that? A city in five days. Well, I see two glaring things in Scripture to explain this. The first I mentioned a little bit was he wasn't there to meet the expectation that they had set. Look what he did when he first got into town. I'm going to read you the scripture. Matthew 21, 12 through 15. Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. We got background music. They were indignant. They didn't like it. <laughs> they didn't like it at all. Why? It said they saw the wonderful things he was doing. Why didn't they like it? Because he was taking their attention. He was taking the focus off of them. They had a grip on these people. And they were starting to lose it. They were starting to lose it. So he was drawing some unfavorable attention from the leaders of that time. He was teaching against their false traditions. Uh, and he was really exposing some things. And they didn't want to see that happen. They didn't want to see it happen. Matthew 21, 23 to 27 says... Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven... He will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Isn't that ironic? They come to the Son of God and they said, what? who gave you authority to do this? As if the answer should have been them. They wanted to give that authority to teach. But we see here that the crowds were kind of still with Jesus at this point. They hadn't left him yet. The crowds were still trekking with him a little bit. Because it says that if they spoke out against them, and he had that support of John, they, they didn't want that. They didn't want that situation. So they chose not to answer, right? I'm going to take you to another one. Matthew 21, 28 to 31. He's talking to these same guys, okay? This is the right next scripture. He's talking to the same leaders. He follows up. He says, but what do you think? A man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and he went. I know I've been like that before. <laughs> then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that the tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. He said that to the religious leaders of the time. In the temple. In front of people. They didn't like that. He called out their hypocrisy in front of the crowds. And he called out their false teaching. They were saying, they were talking the talk, right? But they weren't walking the walk. And he called them out in front of everybody for it. Later in the chapter, you read that they really wanted to get to him then. They were upset enough then that they wanted to. But it said they couldn't because of the crowds. They feared the crowds. It says that more than once through that chapter. Why? Because it was about the power. They wanted the grip of the people. They didn't actually want to lead these people to salvation or lead them closer to God. They were using these people for their own political purposes, religious purposes. So we see that Jesus got right to work when he came in Jerusalem. 
He didn't waste any time. He was coming to be the king that he said he was going to be. But what he wasn't doing was being the physical king they wanted him to be. He got to work on spiritual things. Cleansing the temple of the corruption, rebuking the false teachers, teaching true doctrine. And up to this point, the people weren't really mad at that. It doesn't seem like they had an opinion on it one way or the other, at least as scripture teaches. But it wasn't what they wanted. He was establishing his spiritual kingdom, and they just weren't really that interested at that time. But it would become obvious he was there to be the savior they needed and not the king they wanted over these next few days. And that is what wouldn't sit right with them. The second and probably the bigger reason that Jesus was turned on by all these people was that these Jewish leaders had this strong dislike for him. And because of the things he came in doing, that was turning to a hatred. This wasn't just a discontentment anymore. This was really starting to turn into something. Up until that point, no one was challenging these Jewish leaders. Nobody was butting heads with them with the exception of John. And we see what happened to him. It's not a coincidence. John was killed. If you got in their way, there was issues. They eliminated threats to their power. And these guys had a following. They had a real following. And we see that the people were listening to them. Every time that these guys were gathering together, though, in front of Jesus and he called them out, it was becoming, Jesus was growing and they were decreasing. And they were seeing that as an issue. Matthew 26, 3, 3 and 4. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the, high, at the palace of the high priest who had called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Plotted to kill him. Didn't that escalate really quickly? It went from, we didn't really like him, but they were even there. It said the scribe and Pharisees were there when he came into the entry, right? Triumphal entry. And then they met him at the palace. He started to rebuke them. They already didn't like him. But now they want to kill him. They don't just want to kill him. They want to murder him. They, this is going to get gruesome fast. But before we move on, I want to put into context who these people were exactly that wanted to kill them. So it says the priests and the Pharisees is who I'm going to touch on today, mostly. The priests, okay? These were the people that were running the temple. They were born into their position. They were kind of, of a higher class of people. They were privileged, all right? They came from a pretty privileged life because they knew that they were going to grow up into that. And they thought they were better than people. And to be honest, it seems like the people did view them as better than them. That was kind of conceited. They ran the temple. And remember in those times, people didn't just go right to God, right? They, the priests were the one who could go to God. So these people were the ones who had that connection with God. And people looked at it that way. They, people regarded their word as the word of God. So they really had a strong grip on the people because of that influence. Then the Pharisees were a little bit different. What we see about Pharisees is they kind of earned their way into these positions. Um, they, did, they weren't born into it. It was something that as they lived these, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. They tried to live a perfect life. Obviously, we know you can't do that, but they tried. And they would follow the law so strict. And as that recognition came from peers, they would get into a position like that. So they were kind of more of a blue-collar upbringing, you could look at it like. They taught in smaller community settings, not in the temple. Uh, and they could relate to people probably a little bit better than the priests because they grew up around them. They would have come from those same, similar backgrounds. But don't, don't get me wrong, though, they still thought they were better than people. They just looked at it like they earned it, not that they were born into it. So it might look something like what we think of as like a local politician, somebody who's kind of favored with the people a little bit. And because of that, they had quite an influence on people as well. Um, but both groups had a huge grip, influence, whatever you want to call it, on the people of the time. Um, and both looked at Jesus as a common enemy. 
They both saw the threat that he posed to their rule. So you think about it, I gave you a little bit of a background on them. How much power did these people have? And as you read through scripture, it mentions them quite a bit, always really in a negative light with, in regards to Christ. He was always rebuking them and stuff like that. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this scripture to you that I feel like really sums up how much influence they had on the people of that time. Before I do that, I'll give you the background on it. So we're going to jump forward to when Jesus was on, when he was on trial, it said Pontius Pilate presented the two criminals, one being Jesus, the other being Barabbas. Um, and he tells them that he'll free one. And he's thinking they'll free Jesus because Barabbas is a nasty guy. We don't know a ton about him, but we know that he was basically involved in a riot and he was accused of murder. He probably did it. But if we look a little bit deeper, he was, he was doing this against the Romans, it said. He was kind of doing what they wanted Jesus to do on a way lesser scale, but he was opposing the Romans. That's what they wanted Jesus to do. And he wasn't. He was there to set up his spiritual kingdom. So you got this guy who's a murderer. They know that. Nasty guy. And you got Jesus. And not one of these people has ever seen Jesus even commit a sin. He never did. And Pontius Pilate is thinking, okay, I'll get off with this because they'll take him back. Mark 15, 11 through 15. Pontius Pilate asks them, this is how they reply. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out, crucify him. Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? I'm going to pause right there. Pilate was taken back by this. Not only did it not go the way he thought, he thought they'd take Jesus and he would be kind of scot-free. They said, crucify him. He was like, what? Why? He was taken back by this. They cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. He did exactly what they asked him to do. The, the biggest part that I see in that scripture is right there in the very beginning, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd. You want to know how much influence these guys had on the people of that day? We just talked about Jesus riding in and hundreds of thousands of people gathering to cheer him on, throw their clothes down in front of him, to trample on him, right? Five days later, these religious rulers told them he needs to die, and they all went with it. They all went with it. Nowhere in Scripture do you see there was a separate sect saying, no, don't do that, or yelling, free Jesus. No. They all went. They all went with the crowd. Because he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. And they were told by their leaders. In five days, they went from king him to kill him. In five days. That one was tough for me to wrap my mind around. Five days. Can you imagine? He didn't do anything wrong, but even if he had, there's very few things that you could even think of to want to kill somebody in that short of a time to go from praise to kill a man. And he did nothing. He did nothing wrong. He just didn't do what they wanted. Mm. Mm. And I, it made me wonder, what would these people, you know, when I think of that as a Christian, I'm, kind, I'm appalled, but I'm, I, I think you are too. You probably are. How could these people do that? I think of that and I think, surely God, I wouldn't have been one. Surely God, I would not have been in that crowd yelling to crucify you. But I wonder what those people would be like today. Because certainly they still exist, right? That type of person didn't disappear. It was all of them. 
I bet you those type of people would be in church. Why wouldn't they? They went to his teachings. They were there when he came into the town, right? They were, they were there at the temple. They were there to recognize the feasts. They'd be in church. I think that's real reasonable to think. And it got me thinking about our last year here. I guarantee you they're the type of people who when the government said you can't come to church anymore, they weren't going to put up a fight. These people were half-hearted back then. They would have been still today. And I thought about how in California, remember that you remember they said you can't sing, you can't worship God, because you could spread the virus. These are the type of people that would have been fine with that. They're not putting up a fight for that. They they did what they were told. They were go with the flow people. They were they were fans of Jesus. That was it. They were just fans. They weren't followers. And those that same type of attitude, if you look around the church, and I say the church as a whole, as a body of believers, not necessarily this building, they exist today. The, they weren't Jesus haters, right? They were going with him. They were excited about him. So what made them go? Why would they turn on him like that? Because they weren't sold out. They weren't sold out. They weren't following him. They weren't his disciples, which God called us to create. They were just fans. They were just going with the flow. And so when their leaders that had perceivably to them more power told them to go a different direction, they did it. So I guess my news and my message for you today is if you aren't sold out for Christ, you'll do it too. That's a tough one to swallow. If you're not sold out for Christ, you'll do it too. People haven't changed. Christ changes people, but man's nature is still the same. You have to make the hard commitment. You have to say, I'm all in. You have to say, I'm all in. I really, really, really believe if you aren't sold out for Christ, you will sell out to the world. And you'll do it time and time again. And you'll keep coming back to the altar and you'll keep praying, God, I'm going to change this time. No, you won't. God. Man, that's, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but no, you won't. If you don't sell out for Christ and surrender to him, you'll be just like these people. Just like them. But I'll, I'll tell you, I look around this room and I see people I know are sold out. I don't know everybody, so I can't speak for everybody. I look at what Pastor went through and Don these last year or two, how hard that was. He's still here. He's sold out. Man, I think of Steve and Patria. All they went through, losing Nate. That didn't stop them from coming. Didn't stop them from living sold out lives. Because it is at all costs, right? It's at all costs. It's not, God, I'll do it unless, don't you cross that line, God, because then I won't, I won't. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, that's not how it works. And I want to tell you that that's the type of people you want to surround yourself with. Don't, don't go with that crowd. Or you will be just like them and you'll be yelling, crucify him in your own way. So ask yourself today, are you sold out for Christ? As an individual, don't think of your family, don't think of your spouse. You as an individual, are you sold out for Christ? Would you be weeping at the foot of the cross like a few of them were? There was only a few. His mom was one of them. Would you be one of those? Because I got news for you, 90% of people wouldn't have. They'd have been part of the crowd yelling, crucify. They didn't have a hate for him. Not all those people had that deep-seated hate for Christ. They just went with the flow. Yelled out, crucify. And I have to tell you, the only way you know the answer to am I sold out for Christ, because some people are sitting there like, oh yeah, I 
Sure, certainly am. I wouldn't have been yelling. Only way you get an answer to that is to look at how you live your life. Do you live your life sold out for him? If you don't, you probably wouldn't have been in that crowd. The good news is, Luke 23, 34, as these people were doing all this, he's specifically talking to the guys who were doing it, who were actually torturing him, putting him up there. And the criminals yelling at him, mocking him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And he still will today. So no matter what your answer is right now, if you only you know in your heart if you're really sold out for Christ. And not everybody in here will be. But you can be. Because even while they were torturing him, he still gave him another chance. And as sure as he did that, as sure as I'm standing before you today, he'll give you another chance today. But you have to surrender and you have to go 100% all out. I was debating on how to close this service. Usually we do an altar call. But I just saw this song. I was listening to it as I was re re writing this message. And I just thought, let's, let's just sing this song. So I'm going to ask you all to stand. And we're just going to sing this song together. So, you can play instrument if you want. If not, we can just sing. But as we, as we really sing these, just let these words just hit you.
just ask that somehow God would make this this week, this moment real. And, and then Jeff delivers this message that just brings us right back into the heart of it. I just I don't I don't want to just miss the moment. I don't want us just to blow past this this morning. Take this time right now as, as the music's playing to look with inside your heart and just see where you are. Have you, have you really surrendered your life to Jesus? I think a lot of times in there's moments in which we, 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 we make that commitment, but then somehow life just kind of pulls, you know, that pulls us and that, and that commitment just begins to wane a little bit. Where are you right now? Bye. 
Yeah.